Hi, this is Miss Litton, and this is my wonderful, excellent, amazing, wonderful, excellent, amazing period three class. Say hi. Hi. All right, and we are continuing on in chapter 35, the respiratory system, and we are a little bit along in our notes. The other part hopefully is recorded. I can't actually remember, um, but we are here, okay? So we, in our notes, we're at 35.2, okay, Swedish, okay. So 35.2, breathing and transport of gases, and we're gonna look at some, we're gonna look at some different strategies for breathing and transport of gases. So we're gonna start, we are not this, let me do, because we are not a frog. Okay, so this is positive pressure. Positive is pushing the air in to our lungs. We don't do that. Frogs actually do a combination of negative pressure and positive, bless you, breathing, and they're forcing the air into the lungs. We instead like to draw the air into our lungs, negative pressure breathing. I'm gonna show you that in just one minute. Now, frogs have the ability of not only gaining gases by their lungs, but remember, frogs are what? What category would we put them in? Amphibians. amphibians. Okay, and who did amphibians probably evolve from? Fish. Yeah, yeah, no, no, reptiles yeah. evolved from, okay. Um, so fish. So amphibians are still very much tied to what? Water. And they have moist skin, and they can actually use their skin as well as part of their exchange. And in college, I actually did research on that and the effectiveness of skin in um, gas exchange. So um, that will help as well. Now skin, in order to be a respiratory surface, if it was just skin, it would have to be very what? Large. What are the requirements for a respiratory surface? It has to be thin, it has to be moist and of a large, large surface area and for multicellular <coughs> organisms oftentimes it is near a circulatory yeah some sort of system or transport system okay this its skin all by itself would not be enough in order to meet the needs its metabolic needs and um, the more evolved organisms we go amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals, the more the lungs become very finely divided, and by doing that, they're increasing the surface, surface area. area. So if we're terrestrial and we're on land, we need to keep our lungs somewhere, right, that we can help to keep them moist so they don't dry out. If you're a, an aquatic organism, you can have your gills out here and you're around moisture, you're not worried about it but you have to have them recessed somewhere in your body so they don't dry out and they have to be finely divided. Um, this is, if this box represents our total human skin, okay, this is the respiratory surface, the surface area of our lungs. I think it's something like 50 to one. I can't remember when I made this slide and I compulsively counted out 50 um, boxes and cloned it so you could see how finely divided. We use our alveoli, right, which are actually one cell thick, which which allow for what? Gases. Yeah, and I'm looking for a word. It was in your quiz even? Diffusion. diffusion. Gases are always going to be diffusion. Ultimately, it comes down to oxygen diffusing into the cell, across the cell membrane, and CO2 diffusing out. Okay. We use a circulatory system to transport those gases. We use some respiratory surface like our alveoli are in our lungs in order to get the gas, put it in our circulatory system, transport that gas, and drop it off still at each individual cell, even though we're multicellular. All right, and for us, our negative pressure breathing, we draw air into our lungs. And the way we do that is our thoracic cavity, where our lungs, our heart sits, it, the bottom of it is the what? What's the thing at the bottom of our? Diaphragm. diaphragm. So your diaphragm, when it contracts, it, when it, it's arched, when it contracts, it becomes flat. Okay. So by contracting your <coughs> diaphragm, you're now all of a sudden creating more space here in your thoracic cavity. Your external and internal intercostal muscles right here at your, around your ribs, they pull your ribs out. Your diaphragm goes down. Your thoracic cavity gets bigger, even though you have the same amount of stuff inside of it. So what's gonna to happen to the pressure? Yeah. It goes down. And so now the pressure around us is greater in our environment than the cavity inside of our body. So air is gonna go from a higher pressure to a lower pressure. 
that draws it into our um, respiratory surface. To get it out, we do use positive pressure because we relax our diaphragm, we let our ribs come back down, which decreases the cavity, then forcing air out. But we are classified as negative pressure breathers because that's how we do our inhalation. Now what I want you to do, you know how to do a breathe normal. Your tidal volume is a normal breath. I want you to put your hands on your ribs right here and push in. Hands on ribs, hands on ribs. Do not allow your ribs to move. Do not allow your ribs to move. On the count of three, we're gonna take the biggest breath in we can. Push in and don't let them move. One, two, three. Let it out. Okay, take another one. Okay, now, when you did that, you didn't get much of a breath, right? What if you were always like that? Okay, it's not gonna work for us. We use that a lot. The people who could get the biggest breath in here are my um, vocalists. Why do my vocalists get the biggest breath in here? People who sing. They're trained, they use their diaphragm all the time, okay? When they're singing, okay? Take a big breath in right now. Let it out. Okay, take another big breath in. <coughs> more, more, more. Okay, now this right here is your vital capacity. This is how much air you can hold in. Now exhale. Keep going. More, more. Okay, now you can never get all of the air out of your lungs. That's called your residual volume. If you don't exhale at all, unless, <coughs> let's say, you fall and you get the wind really knocked out of you. Then your little, due to that falling, then your little alveoli goes this. And then when that happens, you're like. <laughs> okay, because you're stressed out because you can't breathe during that moment. Okay, when preemies are born, what they're concerned about with preemies is they haven't matured enough their lungs to allow them to expand. Now they give them a shot of surfactant. Now when my oldest son was premature, they didn't have a shot yet. It was a fairly new drug at the time. So they put literally, it's like soap bubbles down his throat and into his lungs. Because the bubbles would do what? Expand his alveoli. Now you can get shots if you went into premature labor. And they put it in your bloodstream, which will then move via the placenta into the baby's bloodstream, which helps to mature their lungs so that they will open, okay? So um, this process, um, I would like the uh, oldest bio buddy, you do inhalation, and youngest bio buddy, you do exhalation. Go. Inhale, exhale. Exhale, good. Okay, notes. Amphibians use what kind of pressure? Positive pressure to force air into their respiratory tract. Use positive pressure to force air into their respiratory tract. Reptiles, birds, and mammals use negative pressure to draw it in, but what? Positive to push it back out. Okay, what does it mean, um, negative pressure breathing on inspiration? Air drops in, air pressure drops in thoracic cavity and air flows into the lungs. And air flows into the lungs. Process, what are the two things I told you needed to happen in order to get the air to come into your lungs? Diaphragm contracts, so it flattens when it contracts, and then what else? Rib. Yeah, the muscles around your ribs, your external and internal intercostals pull your ribs up and out. Rib cage moves up and out and diaphragm contracts. <coughs> Expiration, you have lack of impulses from the brain stem, specifically the what? Medulla oblongata. Make sure you're sitting up, engaged, ready to go. Air exits as the Positive pressure increases. Air exits as the positive pressure increases as the diaphragm relaxes and the ribs fall. 
the diaphragm relaxes and the ribs fall. All right, bueno. Your title, okay, um, everybody take a breath right now. Just a regular breath, regular breath. <coughs> okay, good, most of you are just breathing fine. When I said, okay, everybody take a regular breath, in period one, they went, okay? So most of us don't walk around, okay? We just have our normal breathing, right? That's called our tidal volume, our normal breath. But if you needed to override that, you could, and you could take a really big breath, okay? Um, and your vital capacity, that's what I was having you, your maximum inhale and exhale. We could measure how much air you exhale. It's probably maybe four liters of air, you know, maybe, maybe two or three. Who's gonna have a greater vital capacity, a male or a female? Male, why? They are what? Bigger. They're bigger. So they're gonna have a larger vital capacity. Now, um, Lance Armstrong it used to be my hero, and they would talk about his vital capacity, what he could exhale, was something like eight liters, you know, of air. You know, that, that's tremendous. Then I had period one Googling Michael Phelps, okay? Now, I think, I couldn't remember if it was 10 or 12, you could Google it, how many liters of air can move in and out of his lungs as compared to our lungs. Tremendous, okay, amount. Keep in mind, the more air you can move into your lungs, right, the more oxygen you have available for cellular respiration, the more ATP you have. Each breath, that allows him to do more, you and I would get tired. <laughs> All right, so, did anybody find out? How, ma liters. How, is, how many? 12. 12. The world record is 14 liters. Who had 14? Um, Probably a pearl diver. It's a free diver, like the free divers that go Stig, way down and go get, Stig yeah, they. Severinsen. What? Stig Severinsen. What does he do? What does he do? Um, Come on, let's go. Michael. I have no idea. Oh, Michael. Oh, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> okay. He's a free diver. So, is he a free diver? Did I call it? Yeah. Mm. Okay, now, this, that, um, the process of where we just bring air in and out of our lungs actually conserves moisture. I want you to think about this. Your respiratory surface, you already know the requirements, but why is one of the requirements that it has to be moist? Why is that a requirement? Okay, it doesn't dry out. Okay, so it's moist, so it doesn't dry out, but you still haven't told me why it needs to be moist. So the gas has like a fluid to keep it. Okay, yes, exactly, okay? You have, you have to have the if you're gonna get the, the gases into your blood, you have to dissolve it in a fluid first so it can diffuse through, okay? So it's gotta cross the alveolus, it's gotta cross that cell membrane. So you have to keep it moist. The reason why fish die when you take them out of the water, they have a finely subdivided, their gills, remember their lamellae, the whole bit, right? But what happens is they smish all together when they dry out, so all of a sudden now it's just the outer edge of their gills is their respiratory surface. When they're all compacted together like that. So, and that will dry out. So it has to get, and when we, when we breathe in, take a breath in right now, you can feel the dryness of it, right? Those of you who run or work out and you're out there and it's dry, you almost choke because your air is so dry, it's drying out your passageways while you're trying to work out. You need that moisture in there. The reason why we can clean our sunglasses, right? What do we do oftentimes? Okay, where's that moisture coming from? It's coming from my lungs, yeah. And when we inhale, we're moistening that air on the way in and we're trying to recover that moisture on the way out. Camels, where do camels live? Like deserts. They have really, really cool noses. Their nasal cavities, different than ours, which are just like, you know, I could look up in your nose, anybody could, you could stick a marble up there, right? Theirs, it's a spiral exit of air. So when the air goes out, it has to keep passing by more and more membranes on its way out in order to recover some of that moisture in the air. So there, it wouldn't be good to have a camel breathe on your sunglasses because they would not have as much moisture in the air and all bolts trigger. 
but you understand? They're, they're trying to conserve their, their water, okay? Now, birds have another strategy, okay? Birds have the air move unidirectionally through their lungs, one direction through their lungs. We don't. Air goes in and it reverses back out. Air goes in and it reverses back out. For birds, air still goes in their mouth and down their trachea, and they still have bronchi, but then it moves to these sacs at the back of their lungs, these posterior air sacs. It doesn't go to their lungs first. It's going into this posterior air sac. Then when the bird actually exhales, the air now moves from the posterior air sac into the lungs. And the air that was in now in the anterior air sac is actually the air that's getting exhaled. If I, could tr if I could tag your air, I would see this air go here, inhale, and then I would see it again. <coughs> the bird, it would take a couple breaths before I saw that same air molecule again. Because it's getting inhaled, moving to the back, and then moving through the lungs, then to the anterior air sacs, and then back out. That unidirectional movement is also very, very cool because much like the gills of the fish, what was going on in the gills of the fish? Counter current exchange. The blood coming in is at a different angle than the air going through in their little parabronchi. And what happens in there is then they get the most, right? If the blood is moving in opposite direction, because it's moving in one direction through the lungs, if the blood is moving the opposite way, you can harvest as much of that oxygen um, from the air as possible. Okay, so again, a counter current exchange. All right, so um, um, not it. Whoever is not it, my gosh. Um, pass or play, one of you is going to do human lungs and how it moves through the air, or moves through them, and the other one do bird. Go. Yeah, it comes out through their mouth again. If I was going to follow an air molecule, okay, so here's this air molecule. Here's some O2, okay? When it comes in, okay, so this air molecule, it's getting inhaled, but in the inhalation process, it moves here, okay, to these posterior air sacs. And then as the bird is exhaling, okay, in the anterior sacs right here, do a different one, okay? As the bird is exhaling, some other molecule is coming out, not this molecule that just came in. During the exhale, the air is drawn from the posterior air sacs. It's gonna move actually into the lung on the exhale. And then it could be on the next inhale, it could move a little bit further, and on the next exhale, it could come back out. So it's going like going in the same tube for the trachea, but then moving to the back of the lung, you know, the posterior air sac, through the lungs, anterior air sac, and then into the trachea out. So the passage through the trachea is in and out, but the passage through the lungs, the air movement through the lungs is unidirectional. Yes? And as you said, the uh, lungs need to be moist for yes. diffusion. So is it simple diffusion or facilitated diffusion? Simple diffusion, because it's gases. What is facilitated diffusion, you guys? Using a protein, right? So you, you're not facilitating it with a protein. You're just diffusing, going right across that cell membrane. All right? So on your notes, coming back to... Uh, ven did I give you a ventilation mechanism? Is that where I am? Yeah. Tidal ventilation, did we get that? No. Okay, all vertebrates except birds, air moves in and out by the same route. It is efficient and it conserves water. Okay? 
Um, One-way ventilation, birds, trachea takes air to the posterior air sacs and moves forward to the, the anterior air sacs. Ever, air never mixes. It improves gas exchange efficiency. Gas exchange efficiency. <coughs> All right, so let's talk about what makes us breathe. Okay, what makes us want to increase our breathing rate? Now, we already know what is the pacemaker of your heart? SA, SA note. Who controls the SA note? The medulla, the medulla oblongata. Okay, how does the medulla oblongata know to tell your heart to beat faster? Okay, the pH of the blood, exactly. So let's review that. When you have CO2, hold your CO2. The CO2 does not move like oxygen. How does oxygen move through your blood? Primarily, most oxygen moves by binding with what? Hemoglobin, Hemoglobin in your red blood, red blood cells. Perfect. CO2 does not move that way. Very, very little. Okay. CO2 has to dissolve into the plasma. What is the plasma made out of? Water. Water, primarily water. So we have CO2, plasma. When you take CO2 and H2O and put it together, make a chemical formula. CO2 and H2O. Let's do that. CO2, CO2, and H2O. I mean, now this is going to be coming in later, but how could we do that? H2, then what? CO3. Okay. That, my friends, is carbonic acid. So take your, it's going to come later, so don't stress out. It's in your notes. Just do this with me. Here's CO2. Here's water, it forms what? Carbonic acid, okay? Now, a more uh, stable form for this molecule is to disassociate and kick off a hydrogen ion, okay? If you kick off a hydrogen ion, now we were H2CO3, I just kick off one, now I am HCO3, that is bicarbonate. That's how it travels through your blood, from your tissues all the way back to your lungs. So the more CO2 I have mixing with water, forming what? Carbonic acid, then it disassociates. I have hydrogen ions and I have bicarbonate. This bicarbonate is how it travels. When it gets back to the lungs, guess what's going to happen? The hydrogen ion is gonna come back and hook up with the, to the bicarbonate, then that will form carbonic acid then this will disassociate back into what? CO2, which gets exhaled. Okay? That's how it moves. So go through one more time. CO2, water makes carbonic acid, disassociates, you get hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. That's how it moves. Go all the way back to the lungs, okay? And then your hydrogen ion is gonna hook back up with bicarbonate forming carbonic acid, and then this is gonna disassociate back into CO2 gas, which is gonna get exhaled, okay? I'm gonna show you some more on that in an enzyme as well, but the point being here is, the more CO2 I have, the, the more hydrogen ions I have, what's that gonna to do to the pH of my blood? It's gonna lower it. Now let's think about it. If I have more CO2, I must be doing more of what process? Cellular respiration. If I'm doing more cellular respiration, what am I consuming more of? Oxygen. So my oxygen must be depleted. So I need my medulla oblongata to do two things. I need my medulla oblongata to increase my breathing rate so I have more oxygen, and I need it to increase my heart rate so it moves that oxygen around to the cells that needs it. Yes? Follow, follow? Okay, so how does the medulla know? Well, the pH is lower. We have chemoreceptors. In the arch of our aorta, where's your aorta? You know where you are? Okay, where does the aorta coming out of? Where did it come from? The left ventricle, right? Okay, so it's coming from the left ventricle. Is this blood oxygenated or deoxygenated? Oxygenated. Right, have we already released our CO2? Have we? Yes. This is our most oxygenated blood, and if this pH is still low, we must have an issue. We must need more what? 
oxygen. And it's in the arch of the aorta and in the carotid artery, we have chemoreceptors that are constantly taking our pH. And if that pH is low, that goes to the medulla oblongata. Medulla oblongata goes check, okay, increase. That sends a signal for you to breathe more and for your heart to beat harder. That's how it's connected. Now, can you see how the circulatory system plays a vital role in maintaining what? Homeostasis. Homeostasis. And if there's something in our body, our kidneys play a key role in maintaining the pH of our blood. If our kidneys are not functioning properly and the pH of our blood is not right, what else would that impact? Our breathing rate, right? And our heart rate. Because our kidneys aren't able to keep our pH right. If we eat something that changes our pH, do you see how that could be a problem? If we take a drug that it changes the pH, do you see how that could be a problem? Because this is how one cell communicates to another cell. These are how our systems work together. Okay, so what I want, if you take a look at this picture right here, okay, you can see the connection between the heart and the brain, but I would like, please, the youngest bio buddy to take on this slide. It's number. Go ahead, youngest bio buddy. Okay, now there's some things in here we haven't talked about that I want to address, which you can get, which are coming up in the nervous system, so I'm just pre-teaching it to you, but you have the ability to understand it, okay? You have your central nervous system and your peripheral nervous system. Your central nervous system, do you know what that refers to? Spinal cord. Spinal cord and brain. Brain and spinal cord is your central nervous system. All of the nerves coming off your brain and spinal cord, that's part of your peripheral nervous system. You have 12 pairs of nerves that come off your brain and you have 31 pairs of nerves that come off your spinal cord, okay? Of those, some are sensory, which is bringing information to, to right? Some are motor, which is taking information out. Inner neurons are in between sensory and motor neurons and those comprise your central nervous system, okay? Of those motor neurons, they fit into two categories. And you'll be able to understand motor neurons going out to do something, right? There's only two places they can go. Only two places motor neurons can go. A muscle or a gland. They can make a muscle what? Contract and they can make a gland secrete. Now they can connect other neurons along the way, but those are the only things you can do. You can only, your whole body, What's the only thing you can do? Contract a muscle or secrete? Every response to your behavior is one of those two, right? Think about it, okay? Now, within that, there is two divisions. You have your autonomic nervous system and your soma somatic nervous system. What do you hear in autonomic? Automatic. automatic. These are things you don't have to think about, right? You're not really having to remember to breathe. You're not going, oh, I forgot, okay? You're not doing that. Okay, it happens for you. Can you overtake it? Sure, you can breathe faster or slower if you want to. Okay, you can over, but it'll take care of it. If you had something to eat at nutrition today, you're not having to go, come on, intestines, move it. Okay, it's moving that through automatically for you. That's your autonomic nervous system. Your somatic is choice. You're choosing to pick up your clicker or set it back down. That's your somatic nervous system. Now, you don't have to, that is all choice. Now, your somatic nervous system can be overridden. If I took this clicker and I was over here and I flung it at Max really hard, he, he doesn't wouldn't even think about it. What do we call that when he responds? A reflex. a reflex, okay? So he would probably respond with a reflex. If he didn't, it would just hit him in the head, right? And he'd be like, what? It's not like if you throw a water bottle to somebody you thought they were paying attention and then you hit them and they're like, what are you doing? And you're like, it's something really cool, okay? So, these reflexes, max dodging away, internal reflexes is what your autonomic nervous system is. Internal reflexes, okay? So if you're going to be on the soccer team and win a really good game, 
you're running around, you need your heart rate to increase, yes? But when you're done, you don't need your heart to beat as fast. Under the autonomic nervous system, there are two divisions, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Okay? If you're under, if, oh my gosh, I have a quiz, I didn't know I had a test today, I didn't know this homework was due, that's stressful, right? Do you have sympathy for them? Yes, that's your sympathetic nervous system. It speeds things up. It makes you breathe faster, it makes your heart beat faster, your eyes dilate, okay? It'll stop you from wanting to urinate. Though some of you, when you're nervous, what do you wanna do? Pee. Your body is going, get rid of all the extra fluids. Like those little dogs when you come home, if you have one of those, like, you know, they go, you're home, <laughs> pee, okay? So, you know, these little things, because you're trying to get ready for this fight or flight, this stress. So your sympathetic nervous system underneath that umbrella speeds things up. Your parasympathetic is normal. So that's why it says sympathetic nerves because it's gonna make your heart beat faster, okay? All right, now, on your notes, okay? Um, go to modification of breathing in humans. Um, did we do that part? Okay, the rhythm of ventilation is controlled by the respiratory center in the medulla oblongata of the brain which automatically sends out signals by nervous stimulation of the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm. The breathing rate can be influenced by nervous and chemical input. Nervous and chemical input. And then chemoreceptors in the carotid arteries and the arch of the aorta detect the what of the blood? Mm -hmm. pH of the blood. If low due to increased CO2 in the blood, then the breathing rate is what? Increased. It's a good adaptation because the breathing rate will increase as the need for oxygen and the production of carbon dioxide increases during intense exercise. Okay, so um, how are you going to remember that one? Tidal volume, just like the tide, normal, go in and out. Tsunami would be what? Your vital capacity. Handy, handy. Good job, Scott. Okay, so let's talk about this a little bit. Okay, so let's see what your answer is, what you picked. Okay, breathing requires considerable energy. Who is it harder to breathe for? Aquatic. Terrestrial or aquatic? aquatic? Aquatic. It's harder to move fluid than it is to move air. So that's why you wouldn't pick B. And then you said all of these. Oxygen diffuses very slowly in the air, yes or no? No. Okay, it's fast in the air, slower in the water, okay? 
And um, the concentration of oxygen in water is greater than that of air? No, it's less. Okay, so this is a good question for you. If you missed it, this tells you a lot, okay? Make sure that you understand what you're doing there. Um, okay, there's some other questions. I'm happy to do those in the review. I want to talk to you now about go to gas exchange and transport. Okay, um, so let, we're going to start in the tissues, out in the tissues first. But I want to ask you one thing. If I am, what, what carries oxygen? We've talked about CO2 and its role, but before I show you this, what, what carries oxygen? Hemoglobin. So why is it, if hang is um, oxygen and I'm hemoglobin, why would I hang on to him in the lungs and then let go of him out in the tissues? Why did I change my mind? If I'm hemoglobin, why do I hang on to him in the lungs and then I let go of him out of the tissues? Yes. <coughs> what? Okay, so tell me more about that. What would affect the hemoglobin? You, you, we know oxygen is going to come into the blood due to what? Going from a higher concentration to a lower concentration, right? So oxygen is available, so I'm going to hook I'm going to hook onto that oxygen. I'm not denying that. Oxygen is available, so I'm hanging on to it. But why am I letting go? Something has to happen. I bound to you. Why am I unbinding from you? We've already talked about it. Think about it. pH, right? What did we learn when we learned about enzymes and pH? Enzymes have a a, a specific pH where they're functional, right? Because that's when they're active. They're, what's the part that binds um, to the substrate? Active, active site, right, is in the right shape. So under the right pH, okay, I hang on to the oxygen, but at a low pH, I change my shape and I let go. <coughs> See, okay? Now think about this. When you're exercising, you need to let go of even more oxygen because your muscles are really hanging on to that, right? They really need all that oxygen. So I need to let go of it. Yes. When I'm exercising, what happens to my temperature? It Can temperature affect the shape of the molecule, its allosteric shape? Yes. yes. So that's one of the factors that comes into play with hemoglobin, how it behaves differently. So let's, we're out at the tissue. Here's a red blood cell, okay? Now, oh, no, I'm not out of the tissue. We'll be in the lungs. Do you know how I know I'm in the lungs? Because it says what? Alveolus. Alveolus. So I'm, I'm here in the lungs. Here is hemoglobin. Now, oxygen's at a higher, obviously I'm talking about millions and millions. I'm just simplifying it. Oxygen's at a higher concentration in the alveolus. It's going to go from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. Now, as this happened, let's think about something else here. Now I'm going to move in and I'm going to bind with who? Hemoglobin, right? So here is, what is this? Do you remember what this is? Carbonate. What is it? Not carbonate, but carbonate. bicarbonate, right? Bicarbonate. And so here, okay, what is it going to want to bind to? Yeah, because now my hydrogen is getting kicked off because hemoglobin wants to bind to oxygen, okay? My hydrogen is going to go right here. What will that make? Carbonic acid. So now that has become this. Do you agree? So now I have carbonic acid, and then the carbonic acid is going to disassociate into what? CO2 and H and water. So now my CO2 will go from a higher concentration here to a lower concentration, and you will exhale. Okay. Get yes. All right. So um, let's take the reverse of that and pretend like I'm out in my tissues. Okay, so now I'm out at the tissues. Here's my oxyhemoglobin, okay? Um, CO2 is out in your tissue fluid. It's increasing, okay? It is diffusing into the blood. Who is it gonna hook up with? Water, okay? So if we combine these together, what is that going to be? Yep. Okay, it's going to be carbonic acid, and then it's going to be in a more stable form if it breaks down and disassociates into what? Bicarbonate. Yeah, bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. This hydrogen ion will change the shape of the hemoglobin, so now it lets go of the oxygen, which will then diffuse into the tissues. 
and now it's going to travel like this, and bicarbonate is going to travel like this till it gets back and reverses it then at um, the lungs. So if you want to see a picture of those two things, oldest bio buddy, this is your slide. You're going to do the lungs, and youngest bio buddy, you're going to do the tissues. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm just feeling like I want to be safer. Really? Right now? Yeah. I don't know why I feel like I want to be safer, but I just feel like I want to be safer. For no reason. Yeah. All right. Now, let's talk about what's going to happen. Oldest bio buddy you went. Youngest bio buddy, this is you. like a toggle switch, it worked both ways, just like PR, PFR, right? It works both ways. Um, youngest bio buddy, this is you, go. Okay, so on your notes, let's fill in those notes. Um, gas exchange and transport, CO2 likes to travel as what? How does it like to travel? Bicarbonate, good. And then A, with the enzyme carbonic anhydrase, CO2 combines with water, good, to form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid breaks down into bicarbonate and hydrogen ion. The consequence, when there are higher amounts of CO2, there will be higher amounts of hydrogen ions, which means a lower pH. O2 will combine with what? Hemoglobin. And travel as oxyhemoglobin. Then let's deal with the two respirations and what's going on. You've already learned this. External respiration, CO2 goes from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. Higher concentration in the blood, lower concentration in the alveoli. Higher concentration in the blood, lower concentration in the alveoli. Conversely, O2 goes from a higher concentration in the alveoli to a lower concentration in the blood. Okay, internal respiration. CO2 is generated as a byproduct of cellular respiration. The lower um, cellular respiration, you could put which then lowers the pH, if you wanted to repeat it again. Cellular respiration, which then lowers the pH. The lower the pH causes two things. Um, 
little letter A, oxygen to be released from oxyhemoglobin. And B, chemoreceptors in the arch of the aorta and the carotid arteries send a message to the brain, send a message to the brain to increase the breathing rate. And then higher temps also cause oxyhemoglobin to disassociate. So as your molecules are, sorry, as your muscles are working harder, as your muscles are working harder, more oxygen is available. More oxygen is available. Okay. I'm going to show you two what's called disassociation curves, which we can discuss when we're being safe. Okay. And these two disassociation curves, I want you to see if you can read the X and Y axis, and if you can, knowing what you know just by reading those and looking at these curves, could you make a trend statement? One of you is gonna handle this first one, and one of you is gonna handle the second one. Okay, so take a look at what you see here. One strategy might be to pick a point and work <coughs> way up and compare. See if you can come up with a trend statement. Either go first or second, but one of you is going to go okay, while we're waiting for things to become. And I'm going to show the second one real quick, just so I can finish up the recording. Look at this one, and, I, and then we can talk about it when we're being safe. And um, review and have a piece of toast. You're super smart. <laughs> 